Hi, I'm Dave Snyder at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but I'm now working as a non-proliferation specialist. I work with export controls and also interdiction activities. Uh, today I'm going to be giving you the talk on overview of export uh, nuclear export controls. And my hope is that you'll find this talk more interesting than maybe is implied by the title. So, what I'll be talking about today, I'm first going to go over the development of international, international nuclear nonproliferation regimes, the main one being the Nuclear Suppliers Group. I'll be talking about both the trigger list and the dual use list. I'll also go over those lists and give a few examples of some of the control technologies, commodities, and materials that are listed on those. I'll also correlate to show how that those lists uh, correlate into the United States statutes and regulations about exports. And also I'll be covering briefly at the end some of the similar export control regimes, such those aimed at chemical and biological weapons, missiles, and also conventional arms. The Treaty on the Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which we refer to as the NPT, became effective in 1970. Uh, it, at that time, it increased support. Uh, there was an increased support for the treaty after China's first nuclear weapons test shot in 1964. You see a photograph of that over on the side there. At that time, which has now been um, 19 years since the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan, that made China the fifth nuclear weapons state at that time. The first four being the United States, you see there are the dates, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and France. And so there was a worldwide concern uh, about the expanding number of different nuclear armed states. That treaty, the NPT, sought to halt the expansion in the number of nuclear armed nations. In fact, President Kennedy gave a speech in 1963 where he said that uh, there were predictions at that time that there might be as many as two dozen nuclear weapon states by the 1970s. The treaty limited which nations could have nuclear weapons, and it defined those states that already had nuclear weapons as nuclear weapon states. They were actually called that in the treaty, and the treaty recognized those same five states as being nuclear weapon states. All other countries that signed the treaty were deemed officially in the treaty as the non-nuclear weapon states. The difference between the two, a uh, big difference is, the weapon states were allowed to retain nuclear weapon programs, even though there was some language in the treaty implying that they would try to reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. But those weapon states also agreed they would never assist any of the non-nuclear weapon states to ever acquire or possess nuclear weapons. On the flip side, the non-nuclear weapon states agreed never to seek to acquire nuclear weapons, but they were allowed to pursue peaceful uses of nuclear nuclear energy, nuclear applications. And eventually that treaty was signed by all but three countries. And those countries have never signed it, and that's Israel, Pakistan, and India. The NPT also had a section that restricted exports on certain nuclear-related materials and equipment. It did not, in the treaty, did not apply to nuclear technology. It was only for facilities and equipment. The treaty had some shortcomings, but it was difficult to get the treaty invoked, executed, so they did what they could do at the time. It lacked punitive measures for any non-nuclear weapon state that would actually pursue a nuclear weapon program. It just said they shouldn't do it, but it didn't, it didn't give a remedy if someone cheated. One of the states that did not sign and has never signed the NPT was India. And in 1974, they had their first nuclear weapon test, which they called a peaceful nuclear explosion. Uh, so at that time, there was a recognition uh, for the need to, to control more than what the NPT covered, which again was just commodities and equipment and facilities, that there was a need to control nuclear technology because much of India's program was advanced by uh, legitimate access and uh, transfers of tra te nuclear technology to the Indian programs. So this was a, uh, a fallacy or at least a, a shortcoming of the NPT. And there you see a photograph of India's peaceful nuclear uh, test shot. 
to deviate for a second here, let's talk about nations that have pursued nuclear weapons since India's test shot in 1974. South Africa, under the previous apartheid regime, actually had an advanced nuclear weapons program, which was a, a, abandoned in 1991. They actually had completed six of what they called nuclear devices. They gave up those devices that were taken out of the country and dismantled, and subsequently South Africa signed the NPT. Pakistan, again, has never signed the NPT. They had nuclear we weapon test shots beginning in 1998, and they're alleged to have a nuclear weapon stockpile. North Korea, the Democratic Republic, People's Republic of Korea, acknowledged in, 19, in 2002 that they had a clandestine uranium enrichment program. This goes after, which I'm not, this follows after, which I'm not going to go into details about, what was called the agreed framework in the mid-1990s, where the DPRK agreed uh, to give up its plutonium production program. At the time, they acknowledged the, the existence of this clandestine enrichment program. They withdrew from the NPT in 2003, and they've had nuclear weapon test shots in 2006 and in 2009. And Iraq, they had a nuclear weapon, a clandestine nuclear weapon program that was discovered in 1991. They never actually fully weaponized, uh, but uh, that was they were they also were a country that were was pursuing at a time nuclear weapons. Now, the NPT, as I mentioned, has a section that relates to these nuclear exports. And so there was a committee set up called the NPT Exporters Committee, and they published what was called a trigger list in 1974. The committee is also called the Zenger Committee. And as you see there on the slide in quotations, I won't read the whole thing to you, but it was to serve as an interpreter that would harmonize the interpretation of the NPT's export control policies. And it defined this trigger list of the vague term or the high level term, as you see in the second bullet, as equipment or material, and notice the underline, especially designed or prepared for the processing use or production of special fissionable materials. And two things about that, especially designed or prepared, I'll discuss that several times in the talk, it's called EDP, it's actually a term of art in the nuclear export control world. So remember, EDP is for especially designed or prepared, not and prepared, but it's or prepared. And I'll talk more about that later. And special fissionable materials, this is the term that's used internationally, for example, by the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. These are the materials that can uh, undergo and maintain a uh, fission uh, uh, chain reaction, these are the fissile materials, which include weapon-grade fissile materials, but not limited just to those. Here's a graphic that shows at a high level the nuclear fuel cycle. And you see two pathways there ultimately to the weapon on the right. You see that either pathway begins with, uh, if you're talking about the uranium fuel cycle, we're talking about the extraction of uranium, natural uranium, from the earth, mining and milling, conversion, and then you can go the top route there, the, the uranium route, where we enrich uranium to uh, accumulate and scavenge the Fissile-235 uranium atom out of the natural uranium. You can then make your metal uh, weapon parts and you can weaponize. This is what we did in the Manhattan Project here in Oak Ridge for the uh, production of the HEU that was used in the weapon that, on the little boy weapon that we dropped on uh, Hiroshima. The second pathway is a plutonium pathway, and you see there you take uranium, either natural assay or natural enrichment level uranium, or you may take some that's been enriched, and then you take that, you make fuel with that, you put that in a reactor. Uh, in the neutron flux, uh, I, we actually under neutron, you have neutron activation, and so some of the uranium-238 in the fuel uh, transmutates to 239 plutonium, which is what you're looking for if you're trying to make a weapon, plutonium weapon. They then take the spent fuel out of the reactor, and they take that to reprocessing, spent fuel reprocessing, where they scavenge the small amount of weapon-grade plutonium out of that spent fuel, and then they make metal out of that, and they go with their weapon system. This is the route that, in the Manhattan Project, the United States undertook at the Hanford site, 
They made the plutonium for the Fat Man weapon, which was dropped on Nagasaki. This is also, if you compare this back more to recent proliferators, the top route, the uh, highly enriched uranium route, is what Pakistan under, uh, underwent, under, undertook, and the plutonium route is what India undertook. Now, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, as I mentioned in the beginning, is an international regime. It's a voluntary regime. I'll talk some more about it throughout the talk. But they publish guidelines to control nuclear-related exports. Again, it's a voluntary organization. You have to have some industry and enterprise that's involved in supplying nuclear technology in, uh, uh, internationally. So that's why they're called nuclear suppliers. Uh, they have to be voted in by the other members. Currently, there's 48 member states of the NSG, as I'll call it, Nuclear Suppliers Group, NSG. And this includes all five nuclear weapon states. And the controls on these are really focused on that nuclear fuel cycle, which I just showed you a moment ago, uh, both for peaceful end uses, such as for power production and nuclear power plants, and also they can be useful to weaponization. These controls, like the fuel cycle that I showed you as it was shown in that graphic, the, these controls are not focused on the production or use of other radiological materials, such as cesium-137 that you might use in a radiological dispersal device. We're talking here about the production of special fissionable materials, which we call in this country special nuclear material. This NSG, Nuclear Suppliers Group, published this first list called the Trigger List in 1978. Notice the same title as Zanger Committee's or the NPT Export Committee's uh, trigger list. It was very similar, but it's somewhat different as well. It's a list of strategic nuclear materials, equipment, and technology. So the NSG reached out, as you'll see in the second bullet there, they capture technology where the NPT doesn't mention technology. And again, in similar language, it is controlling, especially designed or prepared in the trigger list, especially designed or prepared uh, for the, these, these uh, technology, equipment, and materials for the processing use or production of special fissionable materials. Same term again there. And it's called an illustrative list. I'll talk about this more later at the end of the talk. But basically, it's a descriptive criteria for determination whether something is controlled. For example, it talks about it controls plants for the reprocessing of irradiated fuel elements or equipment especially designed or prepared thereof. It doesn't matter how big the plant is. It doesn't matter what type of technology it uses. If it's pro reprocessing spent fuel, it's captured. And there again in the blue, you see at the bottom, the note about EVP again is especially designed or prepared. Now the NPT trigger list has some restrictions. For example, it, res it, ex it restricts exports of these technologies, these equipment and materials to non-nuclear weapon states as defined in the treaty based on safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IEA. Uh, so they, they have to have agreements for source and fissionable materials. Source materials are what go into the fuel cycle and the fissionable materials are what come out. It also controls retransfers. I'm not going to go into the detail, but if one country exports a trigger list item to another country, that second country recipient can't later, when they're finished with it, or for any, any other reasons, they can't export it to another country, a third country, unless they go back to the first country and, and reapply for an export license. Now, the scope of controls on the nuclear suppliers group uh, trigger list are really based, again, on uh, materials in one area, which is the source material itself. Again, the source material is what goes into the fuel cycle and the special fissionable materials that come out as a product. And also uh, relates to the production of these materials, special fissionable materials, through things such as enrichment, reactors, and reprocessing. It also encompasses some of the chemical processes that you might see in a uranium plant or a plutonium plant that go as far as making raw metal. And of course, this would be one of the processes you would need in a weaponization program. But there's no control in the trigger list on any subsequent weaponization activities. Uh, this may seem a little counterintuitive that it doesn't go past that, but I, I think it's because, well, I know that it's really because the, the NPT itself stated that the weapon states would not transfer weapon technologies or weapon production capabilities 
to non-weapon states, and they and those non-weapon states agreed to never receive those, or try to seek to acquire them or develop them themselves. So there's an assumption that there's no trade in nuclear weapon technology, materials, production equipment, things like that. And so therefore, the trigger list doesn't cover those. It actually ends at the point where you produce the raw uranium or plutonium metal. Now, the IEA, this is not an IEA um, activity. The NSG is an independent organization, but the IEA does publish this as a service, and there's the reference to the, the number. We call it Part 1 because there's also a Part 2 I'll talk about later. The first one was published in 1978, not too long after the Indian test shot, and of course there were the NSG, the NSG was created in 1978, and they came out with their first list then. It's now in its 12th revision, in fact the 13th revision is just now coming out. And there's two major categories of control, and they call this Annex A and Annex B. The first one, Annex A, goes along with what I told you a moment ago about the source and fissionable materials. This covers just the materials themselves. The export of those, transfers of those, and Annex B covers everything else. The equipment and the non-nuclear materials such as reactors, fuel reprocessing, enrichment, heavy water production, etc. And to give you some examples of these, I'll go through these at a high level. Uh, the NSG trigger list, again, that NX, Annex A has two broad parts. The source material, what goes into the fuel cycle, it can be natural uranium, and there you see a photograph of some yellow cake as we call it, uh, the uranium ore concentrate uh, starts at that point. Also depleted uranium. This is the waste stream from an enrichment activity, but because depleted uranium still has some uranium-235 remnant in it, it still is a source of, potential source of uranium-235, so therefore depleted uranium is also considered a source material. And for the thorium fuel cycle, which I'm not really going to go into, thorium is also considered a source material. The other half of Annex A are the products of that, the special fissionable materials, and that includes enriched uranium. Anything, any uranium having a 235 uranium content above natural uranium, which is about 0.71%. In nature, it's about one out of 142 atoms of natural uranium or 235. Most of the rest are 238 uranium. So once we elevate that enrichment level, it's called low enriched uranium, for example, uh, the reactor grade uranium we use in light water reactors, these are low enrichment grades of uranium. Once you cross 20% enrichment, uh, we now go into what's called highly enriched uranium, and you see a photograph there of weapon grade highly enriched uranium. There's no official cutoff for weapon grade highly enriched uranium, I'll call it, which is called HEU, um, the, but 90% is generally considered uh, the transition into weapons grade. HEU. Another uh, special fissionable material is 233 uranium, which is a non-natural isotope of uranium which is produced from the thorium fuel cycle. The other special fissionable material captured in the trigger list, Annex B, is 239 plutonium, a fissile material, and the, this is captured uh, for all grades of 239 plutonium except those that have a high concentration of 238 plutonium. And there you see a picture of plutonium both in an oxide compound and as a plutonium metal, as you would see in a weapons plant, possibly. The rest of Annex B uh, covers, again, equipment, facilities, some materials. And I'll go through these at a high level. One section of the trigger list Annex B covers reactors and related commodities, such as complete entire nuclear reactors. Those are obviously captured. As you see there, a picture of a PWR graphic and also the Sequoia nuclear plant here in Tennessee. Also, some of the major components are called out specifically, such as reactor vessels. There you see a PWR reactor vessel, things such as primary coolant pumps, things such as uh, steam generators and heat exchangers. Again, large power plants that may be coal-fired or other, other types of uh, Power generating stations may have very large steam generators. Uh, however, these heat exchangers and steam generators are especially designed or prepared for a nuclear end use, for a nuclear reactor. And so that distinguishes those from these other large steam generators that you, that you would see in another application. Remember, this entire trigger list, everything on it 
to be on the list. It has to be EDP. It has to be especially designed or prepared for a nuclear end use. It can be civilian, peaceful, it can be military. Annex B also covers some other components, such as you see there, reactor uh, zirconium tubes, zircaloy tubes that are used for reactor fuel cladding, and also the entire fuel assemblies. Things also, which I didn't cover, uh, control rods are, cover, are captured. Another section of Annex B of the trigger list are non-nuclear reactor materials, and that includes two specific materials. It, it includes heavy water, deuterium oxide, which is about 11% heavier than or more dense than, than uh, light water, normal water, uh, and also nuclear grade graphite. And that's because these are the only two materials that are will moderate, can be used as moderators in reactors that use natural uranium. And so while they have, especially graphite has a lot of other uses, uh, these were, there was such a concern that someone could use these to build a reactor that the nuclear suppliers group went ahead and captured these as materials. So the export of heavy water, the export of nuclear grade graphite is controlled. And just to make this more complex, uh, graphite that a producer may make is going to the same density uh, and the same purity, which are the standards to be a nuclear grade graphite on the list. If it's going to another application, if it's, if it's not a nuclear application, it's not nuclear grade graphite, even though the exact same graphite going to a nuclear end user would be considered nuclear grade graphite. So in this case, the determination on whether a graphite sample or a graphite uh, a lot is considered uh, nuclear grade is strictly by its, its end use, uh, not necessarily by its technical performance specifications. Another section of the, of the NSG trigger list, Annex B, uh, are fuel reprocessing plants and equipment, such as fuel chopping machines, where you would take your spent fuel rods and declad these, uh, chopping machines, uh, dissolvers, such as you see there, continuous fuel dissolvers, Another section is for fuel fabrication. This is another section captured. So again, you see some photographs there of uranium dioxide fuel pellets, which, for example, might be used in a civilian power reactor. Uh, you see a, a fuel pellet press. Any of these types of commodities that are EDP for a fuel fabrication uh, are, are considered or captured by the NSG trigger list. The broadest section of the trigger list, Annex B, is uranium enrichment. And that's because there's so many different technologies for uranium enrichment. And I have some listed there. The ones that are highlighted with underlines and blues have actually been used in production scale uranium um, enrichment programs. Gas centrifuge and gas diffusion. Gaseous diffusion have been, been used widely by many states. Electromagnetic separation <coughs> uh, is a process that was used at the Y-12 plant in Oak Ridge for almost all of the enrichment activity that went on to make the weapon-grade uranium for the Hiroshima bomb. It was shut down uh, two months after World War II, and it was never used again in this country for uh, production of uranium, for enrichment of uranium, and it's never been used since. The only caveat to that is Iraq was pursuing this program, and they did have a development stage a development program for this technology in the late 1980s and early 1990s, but they never built it and they never used it for production activities. Aerodynamic is another type of enrichment process. And for example, the South Africans use this process for their program. Other types of, pro of technologies include laser based, such as the atomic vapor laser isotope separation process, which we call ABLIS, or molecular laser isotope separation, MLIS. Uh, there's plasma separation, there's chemical and ion exchange processes. There's a lot of different processes that work, at least on paper. Some of them work at lab scale, and of course, some of these have been used for production scale. And also, the trigger list also reaches out to capture some of the plant auxiliary systems, such as the system you need to feed uranium into the plant, to withdraw the uranium out of the plant, your process piping and control systems, your vacuum systems if needed, which they're needed pretty much. Uh, analytical instrumentation, these type of things are also captured in the in the trigger list. I'm not going to go in this talk, in this one hour talk, into these technologies. I, I don't know if you have another talk in your coursework where they discuss technologies, these uranium technologies, uh, enrichment technologies. Anyway, 
here's a graphic, a simple graphic of gas centrifuge process, which currently is uh, the technology predominantly pursued by enrichment programs, whether for peaceful uses, for total enrichment, for uh, for power reactors, or also uh, to a degree for weapon programs. I'm not going to go into that technology, but basically it uses, exploits the uh, one, roughly 1% 1 difference in the atomic mass unit, the, the atomic mass between uranium-238 and 235. And so it does that in a centrifuge where it tries to separate out the, these uh, as a gas. Uh, and it separates these out into two different streams, one enriched stream and one depleted stream. It takes many, many stages, repetitions of this to enrich, uh, to wet to reactor grade, and many, many more to enrich to weapon grade uranium. There you see a photograph from the now dormant U.S. gas centrifuge enrichment program here at Oak Ridge. Uh, it was uh, really going uh, a big program in the 1970s and 80s. And they also put some of these machines in at Portsmouth, Ohio, one of the United States enrichment plants. And there you see on the other, on the other graphic a picture from Urenco. That's uh, the company in Europe that enriches uranium for power reactors. Here you see one of the, uh, here you see some proliferant machines. Uh, gas centrifuge machines. This, these are the gas centrifuge machines that were sold from Pakistan in the early 2000s to Libya. These uh, were, Libya then later gave these up for uh, a large agreement with the United States and some other countries. And so they were actually shipped over, some of them were shipped to the United States. There was a press conference in, I think, 2004 where these were shown with the then Secretary of Energy, and uh, you see some of these proliferant machines. It would take many thousands of these machines to enrich uh, an appreciable quantity of highly enriched weapon-grade uranium. Gas diffusion was what was used at Oak Ridge and later Paducah and Portsmouth, Ohio, for the majority of the enrichment activity that's gone on in this country. This is why they shut this up. The startup of this plant is why they shut down the uh, electromagnetic isotope separation process at Oak Ridge in October of 1945. Uh, this is a very large scale operation, very large facilities. It takes about 2,000 stages, uh, consecutive stages of enrichment to go all the way to weapon grade uranium. And this has been used uh, heavily by the United States. Some other countries have. Use this also, including the French and the Germans, I mean uh, the Russians, uh, with the Soviet Union for a while. Uh, but this has sort of fallen off out of favor with most of the world because there's some disadvantages of, of this process. Uh, one is this very, very intensive use of electrical power compared to, say, gas centrifuge. Here's a process that was used at the Y 12 plant to enrich uranium for what became the Hiroshima Little Boy Bomb. This is called electromagnetic separation. This is what I've referred to before. This is what the Iraqis were pursuing in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I mentioned also that the trigger list, this annex captures these auxiliary systems, such as the feed systems to a system, a plant. If it's using UF6, uranium hexafluoride, which is what several of these processes, gas centrifuge, uh, gas diffusion, endless, molecular laser isotope separation, they all use this material as a feed material. So this is commonly uh, sold and traded around the world, UF6. And so this is fed into your enrichment plant in these EDP uh, feed systems. Also, things such as large gate valves, as you see here for gas diffusion plants. This is EDP, especially designed or prepared for nuclear end use specific to an enrichment plant, and so there's a photograph of an EDP NSG trigger list uh, gate valve. I mentioned heavy water and graphite, nuclear graphite. Well, heavy water, we capture the heavy water itself, as I mentioned earlier, so because it's uh, little used in other industries and it's, it's, a, it's a unique process to acquire heavy water, there's several ways to get there. 
that the NSG also reaches out and captures nuclear, I mean, heavy water production plants, even though heavy water production is not on the nuclear fuel cycle. The chart I showed you earlier, this is one place, one rare place, where the nuclear suppliers group reaches out really off of the nuclear fuel cycle chart that I showed you and bring in an additional technology and its equipment and facilities. And the last section of the trigger list are those are a select set of specific chemical processes that you would need that you would find in a uranium plant or a plutonium plant. For example, in uranium, there lists more specific processes, but those, for example, that would take your uranium ore concentrate, as I showed you in the, the yellow cake in an earlier slide, and go to uranium trioxide. Other processes you see there, there's several of those, but you notice the last of the bottom, last next to the last, is going to metal. So what they're really trying to control here are the is the production of uranium metal, because that's needed for that weaponization stage weaponization program that I talked about earlier. And so this is where the nuclear suppliers group trigger list stops, production of metal. And you see that also in the second major bullet for the plutonium processing. It doesn't list as many processes as they do for uranium, but you'll notice that it goes as far as plutonium metal production and then it stops. It shows like the pictures I showed you earlier of the raw metal disc of, of weapon grade uranium or the uh, ring uh, that comes from the reduction process of plutonium, this is where it stops. It doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't go into forming operations, machining operations, things like that. And so here's an example of an EDP, um, a, a, a UF4 to uranium metal processing plant or processing line. And so this is captured by the trigger list. Now, in this country, the trigger list from the NSG, Nuclear Suppliers Group, really goes into two different export controls. One of these is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. And the NRC grants license for exports of equipment and material, certain materials and equipment that fall on those lists of the NSG. It also is a little more expensive, but basically these controls mirror what you see in the NSG trigger lists and also embedded technologies. So for example, if you go build a reactor in another country and you export that reactor, the embedded technology in that reactor, manuals, uh, operational manuals, maintenance manuals, things such as uh, uh, diagrams, uh, pedigree, uh, quality assurance type samples and information, radiographs, things like that, that embedded technology goes with the NRC license as part of that package of a license. However, if you're talking about standalone technology, standalone nuclear technology, that does not go through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That goes through the Department of Energy. And that goes under what we call 10 CFR Part 810. That's the regulation. And it's called the Assistance to Foreign Atomic Energy Activities. This comes from the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, where there's restrictions on how atomic energy assistance is provided to, to foreigners or other countries. And so again, standalone technology requires a license, or it's not really a license, it requires authorization from the Secretary of Energy to make that transfer of technology, where the NRC licenses the export of nuclear materials, nuclear equipment, and the embedded technologies. Now here's an example, a comparison between NR, the NSG's trigger list and the NRC's regulations in what they call 10, the 10 CFR Part uh, 110. CFR is a code of federal regulations commonly used. You know, I showed you that on the last slide when you saw at the bottom there are both of these 10 CFR Part 110 for NRC, Part 810 for DOE. And so for NRC, the trigger list, when it talks about its entry for these large valves, like I showed you a photograph of a moment ago, for using the gas diffusion process, you see the language there, I'm not going to read that to you, but basically it's capturing special EDP valves that are used as controller shutoff valves, have certain certain capabilities, and it shows a size there, which I've, I've highlighted that in, in red. And really, when you go to the NRC 10 CFR Part 8, uh, 110 uh, regulations for export control, it's actually verbatim the same, except for some reason, when we went to our U.S. regulations, we 
cut out the English units of inches and went just to the metric system, uh, even though we're one of the few countries that use the English like, uh, English units. But anyway, they're verbatim, they're really the same. And that's typical throughout a comparison of the NSG trigger list and the regulations for NRC exports. There's also, if you're looking at NSG equipment, uh, commodities, facilities, there's an internationally utilized insignia that identifies those NSG controlled items, and it's called the N stamp. You see a photograph of a couple of nameplates there that show N stamp. They're typically stamped into a nameplate if the item has a nameplate. Not everything lends itself to it, but most things do. It may be etched on it somewhere, but we will see a photograph in a minute. These are used worldwide. They're used in countries that don't use the English alphabet. Still, it's, an, it's, it's consistently used around the world. You have to be authorized to use it. In this country, the accrediting uh, authorizing agency is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And you'll see there on this slide, the next slide, some examples. But if you see that, uh, if you see that symbol with a leading letter N, as you'll see here and on the next slide, somewhere on that piece of equipment, it is an NSG controlled trigger list item. These, these insignia, by the way, are similar as you might see on uh, Section 8 pressure vessel uh, codes by ASMA. But they just don't start with the letter N. Now, <clears throat> enough of the trigger list for a moment. I mentioned this dual use list, the second list we're going to cover today. The Nuclear Suppliers Group, uh, after, the, after a couple of events in 1991, 1992, decided it was time to push out beyond just trigger list items and to capture some dual use items. Dual use items, commodities, technologies. These are those that could be used by the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, uh, in a nuclear fuel cycle application, but they have some other applications somewhere else in industry. Um, and so they are not captured by the trigger list because they're not EDP. They're not especially designed or prepared for a nuclear uh, in-use application, such as a machine tool, which might be used to make centrifuge uh, components. It may be used to make a weapon component, but it may also be used in an automotive plant. So these are dual use. And so they have this list called the dual use list, which is this list of equipment, materials, software, and related technology that could make a major contribution to an unsafeguarded nuclear fuel cycle or nuclear explosive activity. It's a specific list, and again at the end I'll talk about it, a specific list and compare that, contrast that to the illustrative list that applies to the nuclear suppliers trigger list. Now, it also has restrictions um, for exports to certain activities and facilities in a non-nuclear weapon state. Now, back up here, you'll notice that the trigger list required that the export of a trigger list commodity, for example, goes to a safeguarded facility. That doesn't apply here because dual use items are going to go to facilities that are not under IEA safeguards, have nothing to do with it, like the automotive plant that I mentioned. So those proscribed or at least restricted activities include those related to nuclear explosive programs or unsafeguarded nuclear fuel facilities. That may be a little confusing there. It can't go to an unsafeguarded nuclear facility, but it can go to other facilities or it can go to safeguarded nuclear facilities. Uh, the safeguards, in other words, are not a condition of supply to the non-fuel cycle facilities, such as automotive plants. Scope of controls for the dual-use list are quite different. Uh, they do include a lot of the items, commodities, materials on the dual-use list, and I'll get to an example, some examples of this in a moment. A lot of these are actually what you might use as items of construction, materials of construction to build that trigger list facility, to build that trigger list item, piece of equipment like a gas centrifuge machine. But they themselves are not just EDP for the nuclear fuel cycle. For example, and you'll see this in a, in a few minutes, where the trigger list captures heavy water production plants, they need some items such as packings that you would also maybe use in an ammonia plant. So these are dual use items. So that packing would be on the dual use list where the complete plant would be on the trigger list. What was really interesting is that the scope of controls of the dual use list broaden and go ahead and capture the weaponization activities. Go back to that slide I showed you, that graphic of the fuel cycle, which 
The trigger list stopped at the point where we made weapon grade plutonium or, or weapon grade uranium into metal and it stopped. And no subsequent weaponization activities weren't captured there. But here we reach out and we capture those. Um, and again, it's because again, the trigger list, uh, there's an assumption that there's no weaponization technology or commodities being traded or transferred. Now, the IEA also publishes this document, this list, and it's called part two, contrasted to the trigger list, which is part one. It was first published in 1992, which again followed soon after the events that happened in, um, I didn't mention the events, in South Africa and in Iraq. In 1989, 1990, in that time frame, 91, uh, there was discoveries, well, a little later, 1991, discoveries uh, that both Iraq was pursuing a nuclear weapons program and also that South Africa acknowledged that they had a nuclear weapons program already in existence and had already built weapons. And so that was when the NSG came up with this concept and execution of this trigger, of this uh, dual use list. And so it's part two of the list, published in 1992, now in its ninth revision. The tenth revision was just re recently approved but not yet published. And the dual use list has six broad categories of control. Some of these are broad across the entire fuel cycle. And some of these are specific to certain areas. And those six broad categories are industrial equipment, materials, uranium isotope separation equipment, heavy water production equipment, and then the last two relating to nuclear explosive devices, NEDs, include in Section 5, test and measurement equipment for the development of nuclear weapon de uh, devices, explosive devices, and number six, some of the components that might be used in a nuclear explosive device. I mean, some examples of these different categories. In category one of industrial equipment, there's a machine tool. This is a five axis machine tool, multiple axis, high precision machine tool. Could be used in a nuclear weapons program. It could also be used in an automotive plant, etc. There's another device, a second bullet, flow or spin forming machines. In this one case, you see the photograph making a very precise, long, thin walled tube, such as you might see in a gas centrifuge machine. But this also can be used to make rotors. For for a lot of applications. In fact, a big user of these machines, uh, machine tools, uh, or the munitions industry where they make a lot of shell casings for ammunition are made on these types of machines. So even though it's a military application, still it's a non-nuclear application, so it's dual use. Things like remote man manipulators, again, you see a picture there from the Savannah River site, reprocessing hot cells, which you would see in a weaponization, and a weapon program. Uh, for fuel recycling. You would also see these possibly uh, remote manip manipulators like this in a, uh, in a facility that's working with radioisotopes for medical uses or industrial uses, as would you see a radiation shielding window. So even though these industries are going to be using uh, radioactive materials, highly radioactive materials, they're not fuel cycle activities. So they're dual use applications while they deal with radioactive materials or not fuel cycle. They're considered dual use pieces of equipment. Vacuum induction furnaces. Uh, these are these are used in a lot of industries for special metals, etc. But certain unique features of these, such as small size and temperature and vacuum, uh, make these very useful for uh, melting and casting uranium and plutonium metal. So you would use this in a facility where you have a weaponization program. So some of these are captured, even though some of these are used in other industries. In the materials section of the dual use list, you have high strength aluminum. If it's in round stock of certain sizes, whether it's solid or, or hollow, hollow, those of, the, of you that may remember uh, the uh, Desert Storm, uh, part of the concern pre-Desert Storm was that Iraq was since they were buying a lot of these high strength aluminum tubes, Hello? maybe using these for gas centrifuge. And, um, uh, and so this is uh, actually a very big concern for proliferation and back in the 2002, 2003 timeframe. Obviously a lot of other people, uh, industries need high strength aluminum tubes. Margin steel. Margin steel is a very high strength alloy of steel. It's called a super alloy. And so these look like a, uh, it's a 
It's a corrosion, also corro corrosion resistant, so it looks somewhat like some, some stainless steels or other material, other metals. Also, what we call fibrous or filamentary materials uh, and what we call prepregs, which already have a resin impregnated in those. You see a photograph, it's sort of hard to see the detail, but these are basically like carbon fiber, glass fibers. And some of those high strength glass fibers and carbon fibers are controlled. You also, in that photograph, uh, the more yellow ones, the more yellow spools, those are air mid fibers, they're controlled. These can be, all of these can be made into gas and infused rotors, very lightweight, high strength, and they're really the, the materials of choice for gas and infused programs for making rotors for that activity, which is controlled under the nuclear suppliers group trigger list. But air mid fibers are also used to make your bulletproof vests called Kevlar. Kevlar is one trademark version of an Arabic fiber and also certain composite structures. If they are like the ones shown here, they may be considered dual use until you get to the point of the final fabrication activity where it would look like exactly like the drawing of the finished rotor tube for a gas centrifuge. That would be the same for the aluminum that I showed you or the margin steel. Those materials, they're not EDP, especially designed or prepared for until they're completely finished and especially designed and prepared for that activity so no one else can use those for another uh, uh, type of uh, industrial application. Crucibles that are made out of certain uh, materials that are resistant to actinides, liquid actinides such as uh, magnesium oxide, uh, certain sizes and certain materials of construction of crucibles for this. Uh, this, this is for reduction of uranium hexafluoride or plutonium hexafluoride to metal. These are some of the operations captured in the trigger list I showed you earlier. And so these specially, specially top crucibles are also captured on the dual use list because some other people use them for other operations as well. Now, one feature about these, control, these controlled versions of these crucibles are they have to be also a certain size because when you're working with the weapon grade fissile materials, you cannot have large um, geometric shapes of these, and so in a, in a weapon grade facility, weapon grade uranium or plutonium facility, you're not going to see uh, crucibles that would allow uh, large geometries of these materials because of criticality safety accidents. So they have to be a certain size range, about six inches in diameter or smaller. <clears throat> zirconium. Zirconium is not used in a lot of industries. The nuclear industry, as I understand it, is the largest user of zirconium, but when you mine zirconium, excuse me, Zirconium is also intermingled with hafnium and the normal processes for um, production of zirconium leaves a remnant about 2%, uh, roughly 2% hafnium. It's not normally a problem for people using zirconium for other operations. The reason, one reason we use zirconium in, in cladding and in many structural applications inside of reactors are because of its uh, low, low neutron cross-section absorption cross-section. So it's uh, very sought after for reactor applications. Also, it's corrosion resistance and ability to withstand the temperature environments inside of reactor environments. So it's actually used in many, many reactor fuel assemblies as a cladding. But that hafnium, that 2% hafnium that's remnant with the zirconium, uh, it really it's, uh, it, it absorbs neutrons and you pay a high tax for having that in your cladding and your other oper other facility, other uh, structures in your inside your reactor. So when they have a go through an exotic process, an expensive process to strip out hafnium from zirconium, they come up with a relatively pure form of zirconium. And so the standard for being a controlled zirconium grade or controlled grade of zirconium is you have to be less than 0.2% hafnium in the zirconium. So in other words, you've gone from about 2% to 0.2% of hafnium in the zirconium, about, a, about an order of magnitude reduction. And these alloys are then called nuclear grade zirconiums, such as zircaloys. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, go to section three of the dual use list, uh, these are a few pieces of equipment that would be used to build those different type of uranium enrichment plants. If you're using, if you're making gas centrifuge machines, you have to spin those rotors at a very, very high uh, uh, speed. 
one like the size of the Pakistani machines that were sold to Libya, for example, a while ago, would need to go in the range of about 1,000 revolutions per second, 60,000 RPM. And to drive those, because the, the motors are, the use our AC motors, uh, you have to actually change the frequency from, for example, here in this country, 60 hertz, or overseas, much of the world, 50 hertz, you have to change that input frequency signal, then you have to, to manage that, rectify the DC, and then make a new AC signal uh, of, say, 1,000 hertz, for example, if that's the speed you're running at. And so these are called frequency changers, a very obvious or very um, descriptive title. Things as, such as certain corrosion-resistant valves with bellow seals, uh, these are because some of these plants, like gas diffusion, run at a negative pressure. Most of these run at negative, pr negative pressure. If you have a leakage, and especially those that work with uranium hexafluoride, once uh, air is introduced, you have a real problem because you'll disassociate the UF6, uh, and you'll come up with solids that will uh, mess up your plant, and you have to it can ruin the plant. So these these valves, where normally a valve at the packing may you have eventually develop a, a leak path like your plumbing does in your house when your faucet leaks. These have a special innovative way of mounting a bellows on the valve so that even if you have a leak as you're packing, there's really no pathway for air to come in through that leak path and actually get into the system. So these are specialty valves they have to be made out of certain types of materials, but these are on the dual use list. Again, if you're making uranium enrichment plants, you need to be able to take those filaments of, of carbon fiber, aramid fibers, high strength uh, glass, fiberglass, and turn those into something like a rotor tube. So you see the photographs there, the first photograph, that large yellow item, that's actually a missile fuel tank made out of carbon fiber. Uh, your aqua lungs, if you're a diver, may be made out of carbon fiber on these types of machines called filament winding machines. But you also be, may, may be making a rotor like the one you see there, which might be a gas interfuse rotor. So these are dual use pieces of equipment. Uh, also, if you need fluorine for making UF6 or UF4, you need, you need fluorine to make UF6. You also need to make, you need fluorine for making Teflon or, tooth, or toothpaste. So Electrolytic cells that are used in fluorine production are captured as dual-use items. I mentioned the heavy water production plants, and there's a call-out for these. For example, the ammonia synthesis converters, special packings, things like that that would be used in a heavy water plant. The last two sections of the dual-use list relate to weaponization programs. The first one, Category 5, relates to things needed for the development and testing of nuclear weapons programs. Something you might do at a, new, at a national laboratory, like Los Alamos National Laboratory, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory. And this can include things like photomultiplier tubes, which are used to instrument light, energy, frequency. And this is useful in weapon testing. But there are some other applications for these. So certain photomultiplier tubes are captured as dual use items. Another one are multi-speed light, light gas guns or high-velocity gas gun systems. And implosion weapons, I didn't go into weapons, but the speed of assembly is more in the range of uh, over five kilometers a second, 5,000 meters a second, five kilometers a second. How do you test the behavior of materials in, uh, at those kind of speeds? There's really no way to do it except slam two pieces of metal together at five or 10 kilometers a second. And so to do that, there's some specialty guns called light gas guns, uh, multi-stage ones, and also other gas gun systems that can throw, throw metals together at these kind of velocities. Not many applications for this, some material science applications, and I assume and don't know that some of the things like anti-ballistic missile systems programs probably test these as well. But anyway, there's not a lot of application for these. They're relatively rare, but they can be indicative of a nuclear weapons program the trade in these. Also, similarly, how do you take, what do you take pictures of? Uh, really high speed cameras, and these used to be quite unique, really pretty much synonymous with the nuclear weapons program back in the 40s and 50s. And what you see there, that top one, is a mechanical rotating mirror camera. That's actually inside that box, that dark box. They actually have a piece of film on, inside that arc, and there's actually a rotating mirror. And at the right time during the test, 
It actually has that mirror rotate, and it's actually not driven by an electric motor. They're driven by rotary vanes, and they actually have high-pressure gas stream that turns that mirror at the right time, and it smears that moving image across that film, and so these are relatively unique. They've been pretty much replaced now, as you can imagine, with electronic cameras, street cameras, framing cameras, as you see used there in the picture of the explosion, the uh, grenade exploding. But uh, these are dual use, but they are also used in weapons development programs. And the last section of the, of the dual use list are those components used in the weapon itself, such as detonators and multi-point uh, ignition systems. You see there, actually detonators are really, they just have a piece of high explosive in the, into the detonator and that's, for example, that's why you see in the picture on the right, those are not sticks of dynamite. Those are actually little tubes for packing where the detonators are placed. So uh, there's these items here, but other people need them too for shape charge explosives and uh, mining operations, things like that. Several options. The world's, more people in the world are now using these type of detonators than they did, say, 50 years ago. Things like high-speed switches, uh, like the Prytrons, uh, Sprytrons. You see photographs there. You'll notice one of those, two of those, maybe three of them have a little radioactive symbol. symbol. That's because they have a, I forget which isotope, they have a nickel. Uh, some of these have a nickel isotope, radioactive nickel isotope in them, so that's why there's a radioactive symbol on those. Capacitors uh, in weapon systems, in implosion weapon systems, you really have to get the detonators, the switches, everything really right there next to where, where the detonator is, so they have large capacitors, very fast discharge capacitors that are used in these applications. Again, some other applications need these specially typed capacitors, but uh, they are quite specialized. And of course, high explosive uh, substances. So again, more and more applications for these in other industries, but you also have some of the, some of these were developed and used in the weapons programs. Now, as I told you in the trigger list, how it relates to the NRC and DOE controls for exports in this country. In this country, the dual use list actually ties back to the U.S. Department of Commerce, DOC's license. They give the license of export for the dual use equipment, materials, softwares, and technologies. And there's a call out again, the 10 CFR Part 730 to 744 are called the Export Administration Regulations, EAR. Not EAR, but EAR. <clears throat> and um, this is a list of export control items. And that list itself is actually called the Commerce Control List. There you see its call out. And the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, has the jurisdiction authority over the items on the Commerce Control List. The Commerce Control List has a lot of things besides the NSG dual use list on it. It has items that relate to missile technologies, potentially uh, chemical biological weapons, even small arms. There's a lot of things on, the, on this Commerce Control List besides things that we would think of in the nuclear uh, weapons arena or nuclear programs. Uh, communication systems, encryption systems, um, Radar equipment, think some some of that type of stuff. So I mentioned to you early that the trigger list and the dual use list have these two different types of definitions. The trigger list has these illustrative definitions. There's an example of it there: plants and or and equipment that are specially designed or prepared systems for the conversion of UF4 to UF6. There's the call out from the trigger list. So it controls any of this equipment, any equipment regardless of size, capacity, the chemical process involved quality of the product, it doesn't matter. Where the dual use list is very specific. And so most, not all, but most of its call outs, specifications are very specific. Like the one there you see for magnesium, it has to have that exacting, precisely that specification for purity and boron equivalency of, uh, uh, purity as you see. Other types of high purity magnesium that don't meet the specifications are not captured by the dual use list. So again, illustrative for the trigger list, specific for the dual use list. Now, I mentioned there's also some other similar export control regimes for chemical biological weapons. In 1995, they started the Australia Group, which were, was really in response to uh, misuse or use of the chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq War in 1995, 1985, which was a violation of the Geneva Protocol. And so that started up, and they have lists of dual use equipment and uh, facilities for biological weapons, potentially 
chemical weapons, potentially, and also select biological agents, and also uh, weaponized chemical weapons. Currently, 42 member states, I think I've already jumped ahead there and told you what's at the bottom, the precursors for making weapons, I'm sorry. The precursors are the chemicals that are in the pathway of processing to make chemical weapons, select biological agents, and again, the dual-use manufacturing facilities, equipment, and technology. For missiles, missile delivery systems, the MTCR, Missile Technology Control Regime, started in 1987. Currently, 34 member states, two broad categories of, of control. Uh, category 1 systems are the complete rocket missile and UAV systems that can throw at least 500 kg, at least 300 kil kilometers, and major sub subsystems thereof. And the second system, Category 2 systems, are dual use facilities, equipment, and related technologies used to develop the Category 1 systems. And uh, Vossenar, let's pronounce Vossenar, conventional arms started, uh, regime started in 1995, currently 41 members. These have nine broad categories of control, such as advanced materials, electronics, material processing. Uh, there's also a sensitive, very sensitive, and munitions list on those. Depends on what the item is. And there's some overlap with these with other control regimes, like nuclear, military nuclear reactors are actually captured on Vossenor, even though Triggerless captures reactors in general. Um, things such as software that tests for the effects of nuclear weapons are captured here, uh, machine tools. So there's actually some overlap between the lists. And just to go through a few I can quickly think of, I showed you those machine tools. The machine tool under NSG dual use capture there, there's a similar call out, slightly different, in the Vossenar for machine tools. Uh, also floor forming machines, which I showed you in the NSG uh, dual use list, some of those are captured and in the filament winding machines as well as I showed you. These are ca captured by the missile technology control regime. That's why I showed you the photograph of the uh, filament winding for that missile fuel tank. Uh, there's also, uh, that's the most overlap between the NSG. It tends to be more for the MTCR missile and the Vossenar arrangement uh, uh, for conventional weapons uh, or conventional systems. Some of the items on the Australia group list are actually very commonly used in nuclear fuel cycle operations, such as corrosion resistant valves, while the NSG dual use list called out the, I went backwards up there by the way, the, um, the NSG only controls besides especially designed or repaired for certain valves. It captures on the dual use list one valve, and that's that bellow seal valve. They're relatively um, rare across most of the fuel cycle. Most facilities don't use them, but fuel cycle facilities use a lot of other valves. Those valves aren't called out in the dual use list anywhere, but it turns out some of the Australia group valves, like nickel high nickel alloy valves, aluminum valves, are captured on the Australia group. So these other control regimes actually can play a part in controlling or, or helping to preclude or um, uh, resist, um, impede nuclear weapon programs. So I'll go back forward again. Now we've already seen this slide and we've seen this slide. So there at the end, I've got two slides here that show you up to date. I think they're up to date. Uh, the um, links to some of these you can see those here on this page and on that page and so with that that's the end of the talk i'll conclude now i look forward to seeing you uh, either is it today or it'll be maybe it's in the near future during a question and a live question and answer session so thank you very much